My name is Arturo. This is my friend Karina. And uh, let's talk a little bit about where we come from. So, Karina, you want to give some context? Uh -huh. Sure. Um, I'm from Seattle, Washington, in the United States. That's where the um, Windows Phone Design Team so you can hear me? Oh, okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> That's where the Windows Phone Design Team is located primarily. Um, I'm relatively new to the Windows Phone Design Team, although I was working on all of the Windows Phone developer tools prior to moving to the Windows Phone Design Team. Now both Arturo and I um, are focused on um, the consumer experience, and with that, we're, we're also concerned with third-party application developers helping them create great user experiences for their users. So with that, go ahead. Perfect. You. I will continue. Uh, so um, I joined the team, the Windows Phone team, also about four months ago. I've been with Microsoft for six, six years. Always, uh, I guess, we both involved with design aspects of, of the Microsoft technology. And it's been really fun to join the Windows Phone team. We discovered, uh, I discovered personally this thing called Metro, which is just amazing, uh, an amazing design language. And we hope that gets to inspire all of you today. We're going to have a long day of uh, what we hope are fun and useful sessions for all of you. We're going to start by talking about Metro first. Uh, then we'll have a quick discussion around thinking and ideation strategies so that you can all come up with cool ideas for creating apps for Windows Phone. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about design, how to design Windows Phone apps. Then later, uh, Corina has a couple sessions, one called Refine, which is all about best practices, best practices for designing Windows Phone apps so that your apps end up becoming more enjoyable for users and, of course, more popular in the marketplace. And finally, uh, we also have a build session. Corina will build a prototype end-to-end -end using Expression Blend, a great tool for designers and also developers. And also towards the end of the day, we have a two-hour workshop uh, for the ones of you who want to stay and want to join us. I think it will be a really good opportunity for you to experience a little bit more hands-on what it is like designing a Windows Phone app. If some of you in the audience are going to be here all day long, and you have been working on a Windows Phone app, or you have a Windows Phone app in the marketplace, and you want to show it to us, those two hours will be a great time for you to come here, show your app, and tell us what you learned, and we'll be happy to give you also some design feedback and consulting. Mm -hmm. So just one more note. Um, so when I'm doing the build session, for those of you with a computer, it might be useful for you to follow along with me. I'm going to build the entire prototype um, that we're going to be building in Blend. And there is a little walkthrough that I think is printed out for you guys to also reference while I'm walking through it. And it just might be useful um, for the two-hour workshop at the end to have done that. So just something to keep in mind. Perfect. So let's get started. Uh, we also want to ask you... A few questions. Let me just uh, switch uh, to this computer. How do we do that, uh, Therese? Just press and oh, just like that? Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, perfect. So let me ask you a few questions, because we're always very interested in learning more about you, the type of people that are joining us today. So raise your hand if you consider yourself a developer. Developers. Oh, many of you. OK. Now raise your hand if you consider yourself a designer. Oh, good bunch. Great. Great. Uh, raise your hand if you consider yourself a hybrid or an integrator, someone who does a little bit of both. Oh, very well balanced yeah. audience. I think yeah. out of the different countries that we visited, this is probably the the most well-balanced audience we've had, which is always great. And it just allows for a more rich uh, you know, integration and interaction throughout the day. So that's good. Um, so I'm, let me play you guys uh, one video uh, here to get started. Uh, let's play you this one. Let's hope the audio is not so high. No, that's good.
Cool. So we always like to play this video initially because we feel like that gives you a, starts giving you a, a feel for, for the rest of the day and what we're going to talk about and how you can create applications that look and feel like Metro. Um, so let's get started with this Metro session. This is the first session. Um, today I want to talk to you a little bit about three things. I want to talk to you about where Metro comes from. Because if we all understand where Metro comes from and we learn more about the sources of inspiration and influence that Microsoft had to create Metro, I think we're all going to find opportunities to innovate on top of Metro. Because we provide you with an out-of-box out of set of building blocks or components to design Windows Phone apps. But you guys can also take that Metro design language and make it your own if you want. Then we'll learn more about the Metro principles and about the Metro design language itself. So the principles are those big pillars or those big concepts that define the framework that we can all use to design apps. And the language sits on top of the principles. And these are the building blocks that we can mash up together to create and design apps. So let's start with influence and inspiration. This is the direction that Microsoft was heading to a couple years ago with Windows Mobile 7. Uh, as you can see, it's very different from what we have all seen now with Windows Phone, but this was the direction we were already heading to. Now, as we know, a couple years ago, there was uh, the expectations from users around what a smartphone should be were changing dramatically, right? Expectations were rising and changing a lot. And so Microsoft said, you know, stop the press, hold, let's rethink and let's, re let's reimagine from scratch how the right smartphone should be and should look like. And so that's when uh, Albert Schum, he is our boss, uh, the director of the design studio in Redmond, he started the Windows Phone uh, design team uh, a couple years ago, a little bit more than that. And he was uh, joining us from Nike. He spent a few years in Nike crafting consumer experiences. And that, along with some business degrees that he has, gave him, got, gives him the ability to be able to design great experiences, but then also take them to global audiences. Now, along with Albert, there were a number of really talented designers in Microsoft already. And some of them were already working on products that were is starting to explore what we know today as Metro. This is Windows Media Center, which I'm sure many of you have seen before. Notice it's already starting to look very clean and simple. Only one, two axes of composition, one vertical, one horizontal, and that is the whole UI, basically. That defines the whole navigation metaphor. Notice also the use of typography to convey information and structured information. Uh, very subtle uh, background. Uh, also here, uh, this other screen notice the use of a grid, which is something that we have not really been using in Windows applications in the past for composition, but very clear grid. Also the, the albums for artists. Notice we don't have borders or drop shadows or highlights or any type of ornament. It's very, very clean. The Soon client, same thing, the use of a grid uh, to compose uh, the user interface. The use of typography to convey structured information again. You can see how this text is not all the same size, right? This is a little bigger, a little smaller. Music, much larger. And that starts conveying structured information without the need of using bullet points, without the need of using, of using buttons. It's pure typography. Again, images super, super clean. Uh, the Soon HD device, uh, which was around, uh, around here uh, you know, some time ago, and this device also allowed designers in Microsoft to start exploring some of these early Metro concepts in a small screen, right? Things like motion, transitions, uh, all these types of things were very important. And also, it gave them access to a touch driven device. So along with Albert, you know, some of these many talented designers in Microsoft and many more that we have in the team, uh, these are just some of them. This was the day that we launched or we finalized our Mango release. So there was this big party in campus 
and there was a dodgeball contest, and you know, we like to have fun uh, as well. But all these people were tasked with creating a smartphone from scratch. Now the challenge of designing a smartphone today is that if you think about it, the smartphone today is not what it used to be. Just, it's not just about making phone calls, right? It's a convergence of a huge number of technologies like SMS and maps and uh, video camera, photo camera, uh, all these different things, right? And so all these different things come together in this little screen. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so the way that we decided to empower developers and designers to create experiences for Windows Phone was by creating this thing we call Metro. Now Metro is made out of a couple of things. It's made out of design principles and then it's made out of a design language. The design language sits on top of the principles. The principles, like I mentioned earlier, are the set of pillars or the big blocks of uh, basically definitions, the framework, the design framework that allows you to take those big decisions in your application that defines the look and feel, the motion, the interaction metaphors for your application. And then the design language are the components or the building blocks, or like we call them the other day, the Lego pieces that you put together to define and to design an application. So let's start by learning more about the design principles. So design principles uh, describe fundamental ideas about the practice of good design. These ideas are assumed to be the basis of all intentional design strategies. That's a lot of words. But in a nutshell, again, what this means is that when we all understand the principles, we are then free to start innovating on top of what we provide out of the box. Now, a design language which sits on top of the principles is an overarching scheme or style that guides the creation of a common set of user experiences or user interfaces. In this case, what it means is that by all of us following the same metro design uh, language or principles, we will all be creating a unified experience within the phone, even though we are going to have many different applications. Now, this is a little bit of the way that Windows Phone looks like uh, today, very different than our original direction. Again, you can see typography as a way to start composing user interfaces. Our natural tendency when designing a UI is to make all the text the same size. But here in Metro, we ask ourselves, what is more important in this user interface? And we say, okay, in this case, it's the date. So let's, let's blow that up and make that typography much bigger, that text much bigger. This is the second most important thing, smaller. These are just notifications, per perhaps on the third priority. So we even use little icons and little, little numbers. So you can see how by typography we start structuring and providing structured information to people. Again, no need for using bullet points or buttons or other type of adorners or ornaments. Images, very clean, cut out, not drop shadows, no borders, super clean. Some of our iconography, you can see a plus button there, uh, an arrow button there. We'll, we'll talk much more about uh, iconography in a moment, but also iconography minimalistic. So a lot, of time, a lot of times people ask us, where does Metro come from, right? What influenced Windows Phone? And we usually point people to our source of influence, which were um, transportation graphics and urban signage. And some of those type of graphics like we have there. But to truly understand the principles and where Metro comes from, we have to go back to the 1950s to explore a design style, very particular design style called the International Typographic Style, also known as the Swiss style. This style was uh, born in Europe, even though it had important influence from Switzerland back in the day and some designers there, it really has taken over uh, Europe. And I actually know that uh, Nordic countries, Denmark, Sweden, of course, Finland, Norway, are very passionate about this type of approach uh, in many cases. Now, the source of the international typographic style in the 50s actually has its first origins in the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus as many of us know, is the designs, a design and architecture school from the early 20th century. And they had basically one big flag or motto. They would say, fierce reduction of elements. They were all about fierce reduction of elements. 
And the thing is that if you think about uh, people, right, and cities around the world, for many, many centuries, when buildings have been designed and created, you would always have on top of the columns, you would have things like little angels carrying the ceilings, right? Or flowers wrapping around the columns. Or the doors would have like these knobs that were like little monsters or I don't know, all sorts of ornaments and adorners. And there were social and even religious reasons why we had all those ornaments throughout the centuries. But in the early 20th, cen uh, 20th century, because of social and political and economical reasons, this idea of stripping out of ornaments and adorners and things that were not critical to achieve the function started becoming more important. In the 1950s, after the Second World War, these principles simply became even more important, right? There were, uh, there were a lot of people moving around. Of course, technologies for transportation were growing. Uh, more people from America were moving into Europe and Europe into Asia and Asia into Europe and like all over the place, right? And so we had people from all sorts of places and governments and organizations had the need of a design style that talked to people from every background and every culture in a very neutral way. Uh, people at the same time were starting to move into bigger cities. And these uh, and people were starting to be challenged with the need of being uh, able to consume more and more information and to take faster decisions. Uh, oops, I went back. Now, this design style expressed itself in many ways in urban transportation graphics, books, magazines, posters, etc., etc. Um, these are some examples. It doesn't really matter whether you're in Tokyo. Uh, Seoul, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, or you're in New York, or certainly uh, here, you know, in Stockholm, you will always be, governments and organizations will be using this type of design style to communicate airports, train stations, uh, roads, highways, uh, cities themselves, they leverage this type of style because it's very neutral and global. Notice the use of typography, which doesn't have uh, adorners or curls or anything like that. It's very, very simple. It's of the type uh, we call sans serif, right? No ornaments. Uh, notice also use of iconography. This taxi cab, for example, very minimalistic. It's not 3D looking. It doesn't have textures because when you talk to a global audience, right? People come from different countries where taxis, like I come from Mexico City, taxis there, change their design every year for some reason and in different countries you know they have different designs for taxi cabs so if we started adding textures that that would start kind of talking to a particular set of people and this design style is about talking to everyone um, here are a few more examples massimo vignelli he's uh, one of the most recognized uh, representatives of this type of design style based in the u.s the design style really started started and developed in Europe. He was one of those designers that took and learned from these principles in the European design culture and took them to the US. And he started applying them to do a lot of information graphics. So he's done a lot of work for the New York City, uh, all the signage, again, super clean, very geometrical. Uh, also there, if you notice all the subways and metro maps around the world, they are all about conveying information. It's not about creating a beautiful map. It looks beautiful because of the structured information itself, but it's not beautiful because we have to make it aesthetically pleasing. Here are a couple more examples. Again, one of the key things in this design style is information. The grid system, using a grid for composing your user interfaces is critical in this uh, design style. The grid, the use of a grid keeps balance, keeps proportion, keeps alignment to your designs. Here are a couple more examples. These are the uh, Munich 1972 Olympics uh, branding elements and assets. Again, you can see so very, very clean approach. The use of typography over there to start conveying structured information. I, I always like to point out to the dog, right? The dog is uh, an organic creature, right? Has organic shapes. Yet in this, type, in this type of style, it makes sense when it's abstracted into very clean horizontal or vertical uh, elements and composition and also big patches of color 
no textures, no 3D effects necessarily there. Iconography, a little bit more. The Olympics is a great example of the type of event where you want to talk to a broad set of audience from global background. So you have to create iconography that talks to everyone. And throughout these 50 years, there's been many font families that have been used uh, in this particular style. Uh, the star of the show has been Helvetica, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You've probably be seen it before or used it. You, you have absolutely seen it. Uh, you probably have even used it. Someone uh, thought it was even a good idea to create a movie or a documentary about Helvetica. Have you seen that documentary? Yeah, it's a good one. Definitely recommend it that you guys check it out if you're interested in Metro. I like to say these documentaries not only something you see once, it becomes reference material. It's, it's reference material that you can go back to it. Uh, and I'll give you a link as well of where you can uh, go and get the movie and there are a few other um, pieces of information in there. It is all about fierce reduction of elements, showing information. Information is the start of the show. It's not even our user interface. We as designers, we're not here to create user interfaces where we are the stars of the show. The information is the start of the show. So this is the international typographic style. And this design style has no expiration date. It has no expiration date because it is based on universal and global values that speak to everyone. It is timeless and it will always feel modern. And in fact, even today, some top brands around the world and even some cinematographers are still using this style and developing it. So even though it's a 50 year old, year old style with even older principles, it continues to develop. It's not static. Uh, have you seen this movie? Yeah. Tell me sunshine, very cute, right? If you've seen the movie, this photo you will recognize. It symbolizes completely what the movie is all about. You, don't, you probably don't need to see anything else. Uh, and notice also the use of white space over, over here, empty space, right? White space is a very common concept or element as part of this design style. What that says, what using white space tells us is that even if we have open space or available space for us, it doesn't mean we have to fill it up with things. We could have thought, hey, maybe we can add little things in this, uh, in this empty area. But actually by having this empty, it just helps emphasize the action that is taking place over here by generating contrast. This is another example from American Apparel. A very clean photo right there with the model background. Again, super clean in a very light gray. Very uh, straightforward call to action. Crate and Barrel, a very popular story in the US. Uh, this one notice it's all typography in the box. And notice how the typography wraps around the box. So we cannot read the full word create, crate and barrel, but the fact that we're cutting that text or that it's wrapping around, it tends to invite the user or the viewer to explore and to discover what comes next. It talks and it sells the design concept of continuum. And we actually use that particular mechanism many times in Windows Phone. Uh, we cut out some elements like images or text to convey this concept of, or of a continuous surface of information. LeBron James, very popular basketball, basketball player in the US. We don't need a, a little basketball there. We don't need a little photo or a big photo of LeBron James. His name is all that, that matters in this particular case and that is all that is being shown here. The North Face also, I always like to point out to that logo of North Face. Very small, right? I'm sure we've all had clients where they that ask us all the time, like, please make my logo bigger, bigger, bigger. And it's not the most important thing when you convey design. In this case, this photo conveys more of the concept and the value that North Face is trying to sell to people, right? The, their ability to deliver and provide great winter clothing uh, for their customers. Also notice how the photo is bleeding out on the, on the page, right? And this basically, so we don't have, we cannot see the entire face of the girl or even the body, but we can, by cutting the image like that, we can also convey and make 
the concept feel as it was stepping out of the boundaries of that particular ad. Now, these principles and these examples that we've been looking at have been expressing, have been expressed mostly in printed media for the last 50 years, and they will continue to evolve. But when the Windows Phone team started, you know, defining the experience for phone, one of the questions was, of course, how can we start bringing some of these principles into a digital medium like the phone? It's made out of pixels, it's digital, it's not it's not printed, it's not static, it can change anytime, right? So how do we bring those concepts into a digital medium? And so from the design principles from the international typographic style, the big difference now is that information is digital. And when you have digital information, information immediately becomes more personal, relevant, and connected. I'll give you a quick example. If you're walking on the street and you're presented with this static printed uh, message, everyone who walks by will receive the same message, whether you care about it or not, whether you care about the fact that you are on 8th Street Station or not, even if it's not relevant, everyone will be presented with it, right? When it's digital, everyone, ev the information will be tailored and will be personal, will be directed at you. And that's probably one of the reasons why today we all love to spend time with the little screen in our phone or in the computer because digital information has transformed the way that we consume information. Our brains are built to consume information. So these digital devices just give us so much more of that. So digital information connected, personal, relevant. We have made that something we call red threads in the Windows Phone team, in the Windows Phone design team. And these red threads are basically uh, these also pillars that help us assess the experiences that we create for Windows Phone, making sure that all of them can satisfy these three concepts. So from the international typographic uh, style, principles, we now have the metro principles. Notice we're calling it content, not, in, not information, but it's exactly the same. It's content, not Chrome. So we care, we care about communicating information, not about the wrapper around it. Fierce reduction of elements, typography, or celebrating typography. And later in the day, we're actually going to see a great example from Karina, a uh, Windows Phone app that celebrates typography and we'll show you uh, in a great way how you can create an entire UI by using sim simply typography. Being global and neutral, and of course a couple that come now with being digital, right? Motion is possible because things are not static anymore. Screens can move and so motion, how do we make motion follow these principles? And lastly, probably most importantly, authentically digital. What does authentically digital mean, that principle? It means that uh, one of our senior leads in the design team, Jeff Fong, he describes it as being honest with the fact that we're designing for a digital medium that is made out of pixels. That is flat, it's a flat screen, it's a small screen, and it's made out of pixels. It's the digital world. And see, the thing is, in the past, right, with the direction that we, in Microsoft, were heading to, perhaps some of the plat other platforms have as well, we were in an iconographic world. We now, in Windows Phone, we like to advocate towards an infographic world. Now, these are different design styles. And it is very important to understand that none of these is necessarily better than the other. And I think the world would not be amazing if we didn't have a little bit of both. But in Metro, when it comes to Metro, we really are all, we really are all about being infographic. We want to convey information. We don't necessarily care about the wrapper around it. Iconographic, the icon uh, more iconographic style or design style, is about bringing metaphors from the real world, from the physical world, into the digital world. And in many cases, that makes sense, right? Because that brings a sense of uh, familiarity, perhaps, for people who are newer to interacting with digital objects. They, they will continue to want to see their, a clock that looks like an actual clock, right? Like the one we've known for I don't know, a century in the physical world, they want to see that transport. It could make sense. Um, but in the infographic world, we think, well, that's not critical. And let me give you an example. If we were creating an application to sell music, right, perhaps albums, and we have a, a, we, 
are going to put those DVDs, which I don't know if they still exist or not, but we will have a, sh a shelf, right? So we're going to put those DVDs in a shelf, and the shelf will, made out of, will be made out of steel or wood or plastic, right? And that's the way we would create a, a user interface. But in the digital world, if you take out that shelf, those elements are not going to fall down, right? There's no gravity, there's none of that. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the fact of knowing and realizing that we're designing for the digital world. The principles are different. And so this is a little bit of design principles. Where did these uh, design principles from Metro come from? Now let's talk about the, uh, about the design language. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that very well, it's a little dark. Uh, but on the left side, we have the design principles. And on the right side, let me change this. Oh, you guys can read it. On the right side, we have components of the design language, the metro design language. Now, these components have, uh, are, come from all sorts of different categories. We have things around navigation and layout, composition, typography, motion, iconography, the use of images and photography. Uh, we even have things like touch gestures, right? Touch gestures represent also the way that people interact with, your, uh, with the user interface. So Metro is not only about the way things look, but also about the way people interoperate or interact with the phone. We have things like UI controls, and as you would expect, UI controls are things like buttons and sliders and checkboxes. And, but also more Windows Phone specific controls or metaphors like Panorama and Pivot. Hardware itself, the hardware of Windows Phone is part of the Metro design language. We have three specific buttons in the phone, back, start, and search. That is all part of the Metro design language that you guys can use to design your apps. So let's start talking a little bit about this, about Metro design language. We'll start with navigation, layout, and composition. So in Windows Phone, we have a hub and spoke navigation model. Hub and spoke is a system that basically almost an engineering mechanism to navigate across two points, A to B, in the shortest distance possible. That's what the hub and spoke navigation model advocates for to achieve the shortest distance between point A and point B. You can actually find this type of hub and spoke uh, navigation system in, very often in things like uh, manufacturing uh, companies or uh, airports, for instance, et cetera, et cetera. So we use that same mechanism. You go from the start screen to your application, and then you go to page one, page two, page three, page four, and then if the user desires, they go back page three, page, page two, page one, start screen. It's very linear. It's a very linear type of navigation. We don't really go for branch tree-like structures. Once you get into your application, it becomes very linear. We think that's something that's uh, reliable and predictable for, for users. In this case, you could arrive to something like the main app hub or the landing page for your application, and then from there you take simple decisions to go to the next screen. Now, this is the page, the general page structure, and again, it's not super readable. Do, do you think we could lower these lights over here? I don't know if that's possible. Try to. Yeah. Oh, that's not ideal for video? Okay, so let me do a quick thing here. Let's do a quick thing here. Oh, I thought I could do it. Yeah, I want you guys to be able to read this. So this is the page structure, and for for a for a generic Windows Phone app, right? There are all sorts of different approaches we can take. But in general, in general, at the top. We're going to have the status bar, which is a 32 pixel area that will display some predefined icons and information for the user. Things like battery life, are you connected to Wi Fi or 3G, uh, the time, it will display the time, things like that. So, one design recommendation for you is to avoid having critical 
elements for your application all the way there at the top because they could be obscured if the, if the status bar comes down. In general, this is not a big problem because it's only 32 pixels, but just something to consider. Then the application space is the central area. We're going to talk more about the things, types of things we can do there. Then we have the application bar, and the application bar is here at the bottom. It uses this, these things called uh, icon buttons. When you expand the application bar on the second screen, you can see how the application bar comes up. You have your icons, and you have additional options there. Now, the application bar is a little bit like, uh, think of it kind of like a men main menu, right, that will be persistent and will go along with the user throughout different pages. And this makes a lot of sense when you have common functionalities, common commands that you want to expose to the user. We are going to learn a little bit more about application bar in the next few slides. Now, the other concept in terms of composition in Windows Phone is the concept that the canvas extends beyond the screen limits. And if you have tested or used a Windows Phone, the, the one thing that struck me the first time that I tried it, it was the feeling that even though the phone has a little screen, it feels like you're actually dealing information that's kind of floating here in the air. Because we have some of these controls like Panorama, which we'll, we'll go into much deeper. Uh, but Panorama, it's a, it's a big spread of content. And this is actually a very fun thing to design for, for a designer uh, and for a developer as well. You don't think in terms of little screens, like screen one, screen two. You in, instead think of the big spread. It's, it's much more fun. And when the user experiences this, it just feels like there's like information floating out here in the air. We have this concept of parallax effect, which also makes the background move a little bit slower than the foreground. And that's just classical animation uh, principle, right? When you do that, you start conveying uh, depth and immersion. Uh, and that's one of the things that Windows Phone has a lot. So it's another interesting piece of the design language for, for phone. Then we have the Windows Phone grid. And like we, like we say uh, all the time, the grid is with where the Windows Phone design process starts, right? The grid will keep you safe, will keep you balanced, will give you order as well to your elements. It's, uh, it has 24 pixels, 25, 12, 25, 12, 25, et cetera, and it ends with 24. 24, 25, 12, 25, 12, 25, 12. So this grid is available. We should, I sh by now I should have already included the link to my blog right now. Maybe I should just do it, no, in the break. And you can download the grid in different formats, PNG, Expression Design, Photoshop, Illustrator, even GIMP if you use the, that, that tool. Uh, we have all those formats now. This grid allows you to compose your applications. It's very flexible, it has things like columns, so if you were creating an app, perhaps uh, with an, for an Eastern Asian language, you could lay out some of the characters there. It has rows. Again, it's very flexible. Two-column layout, three-column layout. Here are a couple examples how our start screen is not just random. A lot of people wonder why we have this empty gutter here, right? It actually matches the grid nicely. It's a couple cells, but notice how the tiles also match the grid nicely. Here's another example. This one's four cells. It also helps for positioning text and other things like here, the pivot item or the pivot headers. It's very clear how it's two cells high. So again, by using the grid, you will be able to create more balanced uh, applications, design more balanced applications. Now, orientation. And our phone doesn't work anymore, right? No. Mm, okay, that's fine. We could try to get it to work. Oh, we could try. Yeah. We'll see. Maybe that's okay. Because we have this phone that allows you to like show the phone output into the screen, which is very cool, but it's stopped working. So uh, it's kind of like an internal prototype, or or hack. It won't even turn on. Yeah. Oh well. Well, so well in terms of orientation. But if you, who has a Windows Phone right now in their hands? Okay, a good few of you. So, when it comes to orientation, of course, when we think of 
phone uh, or mobile design, you, you think of portrait and landscape, right? Uh, in terms of landscape, we can actually understand the phone, the Windows, win, uh, the Windows phone operating system allows you to understand whether you are left landscape or right landscape. There are some scenarios where that could make sense. Until uh, like three or four days ago, I had been showing these slides without an example, and Albert Schum actually told me, hey, our calculator actually does that. So the calculator has a portrait mode. If you rotate it left, it gives you a scientific calculator. If you rotate it right, it gives you a, a an accounting calculator, if I'm not mistaken. So if you have an, a phone right now and you want to try those three modes, you, you'll be able to see very clearly. So this is just another kind of interesting thing for designers to consider when creating applications, uh, and for developers certainly as well, that you don't have to just choose between portrait and horizontal, but you have those couple modes in horizontal or, or landscape mode. We'll talk more about, about orientation in the next uh, hour or so. Typography. As we mentioned, Helvetica has been the star of the show, but it's not the only font family that can be used as part of this style. And, and also, well, giving you guys Helvetica would be very expensive for Microsoft. If Microsoft had to license Helvetica, it would be billions of dollars, probably. Uh, and so we decided to instead give you another beautiful font called Sego. And Sego comes with the Windows Phone SDK. It has set, uh, six different weights from light to black. So it gives you a huge range of different possibilities to structure information. Not only you can now design information by using different text sizes or font sizes, but you can also use different weights. This is uh, Sego in dark background. This is a question we usually get. What's the minimum readable text size in, uh, in Windows Phone? 13 pixels. This is for Sego. And as someone was pointing out, uh, so I believe it was a developer uh, was pointing out in previous event, is this the size you're recommending us to use? No, this is the smallest readable. So from there you can go higher. Now in Blend, if you use Expression Blend or Visual Studio, we have text styles that will automatically define sizes for some text elements that you, that you use, um, which are much larger than 13 pixels. Now let's talk about motion. So motion, uh, as we said, is another principle of uh, the Metro design language. And motion, the way we use it in the phone, is to enhance or highlight or reinforce function. It's not just by, by using it as an ornament or a, as an adorner. Um, so in Windows Phone, probably you're never going to see things like, like, like bounciness, you know, like having a menu that kind of bounces. Because again, to the concept of authentically digital, we don't necessarily think there's bounciness in the digital world. Now, that might make you feel like, oh, you are too serious about it. Well, <laughs> in this particular case, I, I'm being a little bit too serious, but there's certainly flexibility if you're creating an app. You can, that makes sense for that to express it, uh, to express that type of motion, by all means use it. None of these things that I'm sharing with you will obstruct you from being able to publish your app to the marketplace. But this is, these are like some of these ideas that we want to share with you to, to, as, as a way to get started in designing your app. Now, we have a collection or a dictionary of motions or animations. These come with the Silverlight Toolkit for Windows Phone. And this one, for example, is called Turnstyle. You will use Turnstyle when you want to communicate to the user that, you, that the user is in a particular context and you're taking them to a completely different context. It's a more aggressive animation. In this case, you can see how we're going from the start screen into a completely different application. So it's an, an, a motion style that conveys that feeling of being transported to a different context. Then we have Continuum, and Continuum is kind of the opposite, right? In Continuum, we want to be more gentle. This is a more gentle motion for the user. We are in the, the email application, and we want to read an email, but we're staying within context. This is Swivel, and Swivel is basically this very simple rotating panel that shows up on the top with a, res the, a respective lightning of the background. It invites 
to, for the user to make a decision. Take a decision, perhaps oh, in this case hitting the, the OK button, could be accept or cancel, but it's something that helps you for showing transient UIs or U, UI elements that will be there just temporarily. And then we have slide, and slide helps you communicate dead end scenarios. So scenarios or screens where there's no more further to explore. In this case, we choose theme. We make our theme selections, but that's as far as we can get. And notice how this one's different. Comes from the bottom to the top. And it, again, emphasizes the fact that that's, that's it, right? There's no further selection we can, or no further screen we can go to. You, you can create custom motions, as, uh, as we were saying a moment ago. You can. Uh, here are a few examples, just so you get the feel. We use a, a lot of ease out, uh, ease in as well, to slow down the animation towards the end. Uh, designers with flash experience, After Effects experience, After Effects experience as well. You guys will be very familiar with these type, types of things. There is one thing I like to point out here, which is a tile. Notice how one of our tiles will rotate the next one on the right right there you see that one rotating so it's gonna come back again so but notice how that tile rotates right now that could have been a, a 3d cube kind of rotating with an explosion or something like that but it's not so the metro design language again super clean it feels very flat but we do treat planes as elements that can rotate like in this case in space but again, continues to sell this idea of uh, it's more like a multi-layered structure versus an actual 3D type of environment. Iconography. We talked a a about this one as well. The star, right? The star could be yellow, glowing with sparkles. But again, we don't like that. It's minimalistic, conveying only what's needed. Here are some of the icons that we uh, are including as part of the Windows Phone SDK. And if we have time again, we'll give you an example of how you can create your own. Themes and personalization. Users can choose an accent color in their phone. These are some of the colors. And so as a developer, as a designer, you can opt in to take some of these accent color of the user into your application. Or you could also decide not to do so. Uh, I'll tell you a couple ideas of when you would want to truly adopt and respect the accent color and when probably it's not critical that you do that. Another aspect, in, aside from the accent color, is the theme, uh, is the background color. In this case, you can have a dark or black theme or you can have a light theme which will make, make the background white. These are a couple things to consider also when designing an app. If you are using fixed white color on some text or some icons in your application and the user chooses the light background, right, then those elements will be unreadable. So in Expression Blend or Visual Studio, there are ways for you to set the color of elements to some system colors so that your application can respond much better to this. Karina will take us much deeper uh, on this in, uh, in her session. Uh, in terms of the accent color, the accent color is something that we use for also conveying function. For instance, if you've taken a look at the email application in Windows Phone, when items have not been read, they will be displayed by using the accent color of the user. If they've been read, they will switch to light gray. So you can use the accent color to highlight functionality as well, not only the aesthetics of it. Uh, a case where you would say, hey, I don't want to use the accent color of the user in my app is when your brand or the brand of your client is really, really strong or you want to convey a more immersive experience about uh, going to, say, a particular restaurant. If you, were, if you were creating an application for a restaurant or a chain of restaurants so a particular car company, right? Uh, like Volvo, for instance, right? Volvo might not necessar necessarily want uh, pink or yellow, well, yellow, I guess so, but uh, pink or, I don't know, green 
in their user interface. So when you have a strong brand, it's not critical that you use the accent color. You have flexibility, depending on the scenario. This is the way that we would use uh, images. Let's talk about images and photos. Mm. I've been showing you a lot of photos, right, that look like square, square cut out. So a lot of people think that they have to always use photos in square kind of shape. But it's not critical. You can also use rectangular shapes. Uh, as long as you follow the grid, you should be fine. So if you ever had to have the need to expose perhaps thumbnails for videos that are 4 by 3 or 16 by 9 proportion, that's totally fine. Just follow the grid and, and you should be fine. So it's not only squares as we've usually seen in, in phone. Also the use of infographics. Infographics uh, hang out really well with Metro. They're all about information. A, a better use of infographics in Metro is when, again, there are no borders or anything around them. They're just clean and usually floating on top of the panorama or pivot background. This is a panorama control, and again, we'll learn more about panorama. Uh, one thing I'd like to comment here about the panorama is that a lot of times people think they have to select a photo that fills, the entire, fills up the entire panorama area. But in this case, notice how this background is used as a very subtle kind of footer that conveys or highlights the function that this is a golf application. Uh, let me see if this is animated. No. Notice this particular image here, this little infographic. This infographic right here, it's a little abstraction of the golf course, right? It's an infographic. And a lot of people would also ask me, like, why are you not framing this inside of a square or a rectangle? And again, the reason is because it's more of an infographic. And infographics look much better when they're floating on top of, of the background. Here's another example of that. Uh, this avatar in the, in the Xbox app, it also, it's not framed inside of a square or a rectangle. It's just kind of floating there, even has a little bit of a shadow or some shading going on there, which emphasizes that feeling of depth. Again, without making it 3D, but it starts having kind of like multi-layered uh, depth. Uh, notice that the arm of the avatar is overlapping a little bit with some of those tiles over here. And that is kind of a very gentle, uh, nice way of breaking the grid. So the grid, using the grid don't necessar doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to be square shaped and everything has to be aligned uh, to in, in like boxes. You can have elements that are probably more organic like in this case and have break that the, the grid, have, that, have those break the grid a little bit gently. It's still within the grid and that's what keeps it balanced but uh, it gives for some good options. I missed explaining this concept here. This is the splash screen for an application that we're going to take a look at later. And uh, here, this is a design tip for, for developers as well. This image that was used to create this splash screen was probably licensed from a stock photo service like Getty Images or iStock Photo, one of those. And when this image was licensed, most possibly, it came with a blue sky, right? Because the sky, that's what the color is. But the branding of this application says that the, the application will be white, green, and black. So a typical approach, a natural approach for us to use imagery in our applications is that we use it the way it's provided to us. In this case, the sky would be blue. But instead of that, the, the designer felt free to go into Photoshop take out that blue color from the sky, and that made it beautifully unified to the rest of the application. It allowed it to follow the branding. So as a designer, as a developer, feel free to get some of these assets and tweak them, edit them, to match your branding needs. Um, it's a couple more examples of Panorama, uh, one, up, one up there. That one does use a full-blown um, image that fills the entire screen. The only recommendation there is to be careful that, because you are going to have some floating UI elements on top of it, you want those elements to be readable. You can achieve that by either by deciding that you will be curating some of the images. You will curate the images before they are actually used. 
or by using a semi-transparent uh, rectangle, perhaps in white or black, usually. Um, and it's ideal if that rectangle doesn't necessarily have a gradient, but it, instead it's just a flat, single black or white, semi-transparent color. Uh, touch targets and touch uh, gestures. As we said, Metro is not only about the way things look, but the way people interact with them. Now we have a very simple language for gestures. We have the tap gesture, which is basically for selecting elements, very simple. Double tap allows you to navigate back and forth between different zoom in levels in an, in an object, of an object, or between contexts for the same object. Panning basically anchors the content of the, of the UI to your finger and it will follow your finger until you release. It is the typical panning uh, uh, gesture that we've used in any other touch device. Flick is kind of similar but flick is more like throwing things. Flick will reposition elements to other positions on the screen. It is also the type of motion, uh, gesture that users utilize when they have more like a list and they're searching for something. They don't really pan that out. They flick until they find it. Touch and hold, it's uh, basically something similar to right click in the desktop world, the way we use it. Touch and hold will always, almost always display a context menu with more options for the user to to select from uh, for a particular element. Then multi-touch gestures, we have pinch and stretch, very common, right, for maps and photos, very simple. And then we have this concept of four points. And so the Windows Phone operating system actually allows you to uh, read up to 10 touch points, but most of the hardware around the world only allows for four. So that's what we call these four. But this is where you can bring in your own gestures. This is where you could design your gestures based on four points. An example would be an application where you have uh, sort of a knob or something and you want to rotate it, you want to make it feel more like you need three or four fingers to use it, that's where you could bring in a gesture like that. Um, one thing of course to consider, as soon as you decide to go in for your own gestures, stepping out of the conventional ones, there's freedom but there's also the need right, to test them with users and make sure that everyone gets those gestures uh, easily. Target size guidelines, this is always an interesting topic. So nine pixels is the recommended minimum touch target for elements in your user interface. Nine pixels, that's a recommended one. The actual minimum touch target is seven pixels. So from seven to nine and beyond, of course, users will be safe. When doing user testing, the team found uh, a substantial increase in success when users were presented with objects that were from seven to nine pixels at least uh, in their touchable area. Now, this is the minimum visual size for a touchable item. This is the actual visual size, five pixels. This means that you can have a really small, tiny object of five pixels, but then what you will want to do is you will want to extend it, its touch area to be nine pixels. So that allows you, again, to have smaller objects, you just make the touchable area larger. This is actually, this has become so critical for the design studio, for the phone design studio, that uh, aside from delivering red lines at the end of each of our cycles, uh, design cycles, we also release uh, green lines. Now, if you're familiar with the concept of red lines, red lines are basically like blueprints, right? Blueprints. Uh, where that specify the specific pixel dimensions of the position of elements. And they actually look kind of like blueprints. They have measurements and dimensions and specifications. That red line give, uh, basically leaves no room for ambiguity in where things are going to be placed. Now green lines are focused on specifying the touchable areas for elements. When you start extending your touchable area, you're going to get to points where you might have elements that are too close to each other. So you want to avoid these type of scenarios where you have two touchable areas overlapping on top of each other because that could cause you know, irregular uh, behavior for the user. 
it's better if you separate them like this and even more if you have a little bit of buffer in between both. These are a couple example of examples of some of the grid lines that the team has created. This is the, the call um, UI. Notice how the end call button, the actual touchable area is considerably bigger. 24 pixels to the top, 24 pixels to the bottom. It doesn't have to have the same touchable area everywhere. Here, of course, it's the end of the screen, so we pushed it 12. Here we pushed it 12 uh, as well. Very, very close to this one. Same thing up, up there. But this is also starts giving you an, an interesting idea of how you as a designer, or you as a developer, have to consider this specific concept. It requires uh, kind of its particular or special attention. This is another example. Uh, in this case, we, we don't need to have a big, big arrow button there. The button can still be nice and smaller. But look at the touchable area. It's much, much bigger, right? And these green lines, green lines document allows you, allow you to express these dimensions. In terms of perceived uh, performance, I'm not going to get too deep into this, but this uh, table, uh, which is also available in the UX guidelines for MSDN, in MSDN for Windows Phone, gives you a really good idea of the types of things that we recommend you do to help improve the perceived performance of an application. So for example, when you uh, have instantaneous response type of objects like controls, we recommend that you use a tilt animation for those controls. The tilt animation will communicate instantaneous reaction to the user input. And Karina will also teach us how to incorporate tilt into objects. And then from there we go to different types of controls, the ones that require very short weight, moderate weight, even long weight, and we have some ideas there on how to improve the perceived performance. Talking about controls, so in terms of controls we have um, panorama that I want to talk to you about. So we've seen a little bit of panorama, right, in previous images. Panorama, the best way to describe it is, uh, think of it as the cover of a magazine, a magazine cover. You have to think of it as a whole spread of information. You don't think about it in terms of screen one, two, three. There is some consideration you have to have when framing how you're going to present that information in different panels, panel one, two, three, four. But the way you design it is without necessar necessarily, is not necessarily with boundaries. Uh, another concept here in Panorama is here. Notice how these elements, these elements right here, which basically show a little bit of what comes next. This is something we call content peaking. And content peaking is basically emphasizing that same concept we saw in the crate, uh, crate and barrel box where text was wrapping around and it was inviting the user to continue to explore. This is cutting text or text and images a little bit, selling the concept of continuum. There's a continuous surface of information here. Notice also that the panorama usually welcomes people with a menu. This is a menu that would take people to the main sections or functions of your application. And then from there, that's where it's when it starts getting more like magazine-like. I'll leave Pivot for for our design session. I'll continue with Panorama. Notice uh, another concept here in Panorama is that if you notice these six elements, these six elements would not fit within the same screen at the same time, right? They're much wider. But that's against that's the types of things that you're encouraged to do with Panorama because that m treats a Panorama more as a continuum surface of information. Here's another example. You have the welcome menu. I'll show you with a mouse cursor. You have the welcome menu, you have some content picking over here. Notice how here you have a different layout f compared to this one that we were seeing here. Now we have one big item for the latest watched video. You have four smaller kind of squares showing the latest shows that you've seen. And then this is a longer uh, landscape mode type of element. So you can play a lot with that type of 
uh, with those type of layouts. And actually, I might be able to show you this one here. Here are a couple more, Food Assistant and Facebook, some great apps. Um, notice here on this one in Food Assistant, we have a menu, we have a background image, which is kind of lightened up. Uh, there are a couple ways that this might have been done. It might have been treated previously in Photoshop, or if this image is dynamic and it will be updated depending on the meal or the recipe of the day, then this image might actually have a semi-transparent element on top of it. So those would be a couple different ways of doing that. I can notice the very different layout in this panorama compared to the previous ones we've seen. Facebook, also it's super cool, you have a, the main menu. Notice how, the, how this main menu uses icons next to the functions. And the reason for them to decide to include icons here, even though the word is specific enough, is that most people in the world started using Facebook via the web, right, via the website. And so everyone, be everyone became very familiar with the icons that take you to the different sections in Facebook, and they wanted to emphasize that. Makes sense. Here in this grid, you have, notice how these are four, like, little elements, but they're still preserved in the grid. So there is a lot of functionality and a lot of different layouts. Here in Expression Design, actually, we've been getting a lot of feedback and uh, have a lot of work to do when we get back in terms of creating more templates for you. And so in this panorama uh, layout, you can start seeing more ideas for layouts. You can have lists, of course. And by the way, lists, if you have lists that require more than 12 elements, you might start struggling with performance in, in panoramas. It's better to keep lists short. Remember that panoramas are more like magazine covers. You don't have to provide all the content in the magazine cover, right? It's just the little snippets, the things that are most interesting for that particular moment. Here are a few more layouts. One big featured item, a gallery. So you guys can do here anything you want. And the key is that you follow the grid. Let me turn on the grid layer here. And you will notice that grid that I showed you earlier. Notice how everything matches that grid. Has that separation. This one, which is a bigger item as well. This one, which is even a, a little bit more of a complex layout. But again, the grid is the thing that ends up helping you uh, compose. This one, which we already saw, so I'm not going to go too deep into this one. So now we can start taking a look at the different uh, controls. Um, this is the app bar. We talked about the app bar early in, in the session, right? Has these icon buttons and ellipses. If you touch the ellipses, the, the app bar extends and exposes one additional option or many, depending on your needs. If it's many of them, then the user can scroll through them. As of Mango, we also have a mini app bar, mini application bar. This releases more pixels for your UI instead of consuming more. But at the same time, it doesn't allow you to host icon buttons, so no icon buttons. But you do have some options back here. These are still very, very use, uh, useful depending on your different scenarios. In terms of controls, user interface controls, we have the typical ones like button, checkboxes, radio buttons. So button, have a push button, which is a normal button. We have a toggle button, which is mostly used for settings, things like on and off. We have the application bar icon buttons that we talked about before. Uh, dialog buttons, which are basically like push buttons, but they usually go in pairs or a single button for the user to take a make a decision. And the command buttons, which have a label, and then you have a description. Checkbox, there's not a lot to talk about checkbox. It's just, it just works the way you would expect. Same thing for radio button. Slider, uh, same thing. But you, it works as you would expect. Very minimalistic slider. It only has what it needs. You can have, you can have the thumb be displayed, or you could turn it off as well. The tick marks, I don't know if you guys can see them. They're very subtle there. Um, 
they are you can configure them you can turn them on and off as well progress bar in terms of progress bar there are a couple different approaches that you can use you have this one which is a very thin line on the top could also be positioned anywhere else like in these examples and this bar is a progress bar control that you would use when you are communicating that a process is taking place a process that goes from zero to a hundred percent or from not completed to completed, right? It's a process. Uh, if you use these dots, like this one, I don't know if it's even visible there on the screen, these little dots that move in and move out, that's when you want to communicate the fact that something is happening. It doesn't necessarily, ha it's not necessarily going from zero to 100%. It will hopefully be finished one day, but it doesn't necessarily have a, 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 a number range. We also have, this loader over here, which is what you would use, this loader control to show when the entire page is loading. This is also the control that is used when your application is loading. Listbox, a very flexible control. We've seen list, lists of content throughout the different examples that we've seen today. Lists uh, can be configured and customized in, in many, many different ways. The list box is a control that you would also use to create something like a grid, something like this. They can have buttons or additional icons inside of them. Talking about text controls, we have text block, which is a fixed label that is not editable. These are, these are, these are the type of label that, that is used in things like radio buttons and check boxes, but also any other text that doesn't require for editing. Text box is editable. Every time you tap, the user taps on uh, text box, it, the keyboard will be displayed. Password box, uh, it's a text box where the but the characters are masked. And then we have rich uh, text box. I still don't have an example for this. Uh, rich text box is basically a text box that allows you to have text in multiple sizes, different colors and weights and styles. Then keyboards. Uh, keyboards is a whole world on its own when it comes to phone because we have keyboards in different languages and in different modes. We, for example, have a keyboard for dialing a phone number, right? So I think you can find this very similar thing in other platforms. Here we have, this is the, the default keyboard. Uh, on the right, you can see something we call the candidate window. When the user star starts typing here, they are provided with words that seem to match what they are typing. These are things that you as a designer, as a developer, ca developer can select to turn on or off depending on your experience. This is an auto-suggest window as well. And these will also recommend you different uh, phrases, not necessarily words, but phrases, or perhaps previous items in your history, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you guys can choose if you want to use that. The browser control is basically a rendering surface that renders uh, content uh, from the web. Uh, it doesn't have to have any Chrome or, or buttons, but if you wanted to have an address bar or something on top of it, you could add it if you, want to, if you wanted to. So the browser control is a good way for you to bring in content from the web and make it feel more like part of your application. You can always send uh, your users to the actual browser if you want for some a particular reason, and I can think of many actually, to send your user to the actual browser and have them consume that content in the browser. The fact that we have a back button, when the user is done with reviewing that article or that particular piece of content, they can always press the back button and go back to your application. Unless they've drilled into different pages, in which case they will be taken to previous pages. Uh, maps, we have a maps control this would be a typical scenario that we use in maps. Uh, you have a list of results or things that you were looking for. You select one, you're taken to the details of that particular uh, item, and you can see a preview of the map. Notice that here, ideally, the map would go all the way to the left without leaving this empty kind of a three pixel gap. That's a typical way we, sh we use maps in apps they start immediately providing you with some information, the location of, the, of that particular place and some of the surrounding streets. But if you tap over here, then you're taken to a full 
experience, full map experience, where the user can uh, learn more about the different, you know, the location or even other uh, matches that will be showing up nearby. Video and audio. For those of you with Silverlight experience, uh, the control is called Media Element, right? It allows you to embed video or audio or to show, display video and audio that is currently being served from the browser, from the server, sorry. And the, this is one thing to, like a heads up, we do not provide an out-of-the-box video player for Windows Phone. So you can design your uh, the controls based on on your particular need. Here are a few that are very similar. Uh, you know, many of them use the si very similar icons, but this one this one has a thumb for scrubbing throughout the length of the video. This one doesn't. Oh, this one here, by the way, it has this button that allows you to fill the entire screen with the video for like you know when you're dealing with like four by three or sixteen by nine type of videos. Here's another one. Also, when you design those controls, it's important to show uh, where the playhead is at and how much of the video has been loaded. Those are a couple of things to consider. Also, when it comes to video and audio, you have the, uh, the opportunity in your experience to connect your application to the music and videos hub as part of phone. The way this works is that the uh, user would go into the music and videos hub they would be taken inside of it. There is a, an apps section where the apps that are hooking up to this particular hub will be exposed. And this is actually something cool because that means that your application is going beyond your application. It's starting to hook up into other services in the phone. And it also gives more opportunities for your application to be launched. It's not only when the user taps the icon button in the in the application screen, you can also, the user can also access your application when they are here in this particular area. You can even get to the point where of exposing some of the recently watched content in your application and that content will be displayed as part of the history here in the music uh, and videos hub. So this is part of a lot of this kind of work that the Windows Phone team is doing to help you take your application outside of your application and really anchor it and hook it up to all these other hubs and services inside of, inside of the phone. Notifications. We have three types of notifications, toast, tile, and raw. This is toast. This is a notification that will come down. You guys, your applications can send these notifications. Uh, it will be displayed in the accent color of the user. That little icon you see there can be your own. If you desire to do so, it's highly recommended you use your own uh, icon there, your logo, so that people can immediately identify where this notification is come from. If uh, the user taps the notification, they will be taken into your application. So again, another way in which people and users can go into your application without necessarily going to your icon. They have different ways into your application. If the user ignores the notification or swipes the notification horizontally, the notification will be dismissed. I'll talk about tile notifications uh, a little later. And raw notifications are basically just notifications within an application. So this starts uh, taking me into the final part of this, um, this uh, session. And we have a break at 2 p.m., if I'm not mistaken, right? For the first kind of big session. Hopefully, uh, a lot of you will join us for the next two. Uh, so it starts taking me to the concept of one experience. You might have noticed that in the previous couple controls, I started emphasizing a lot this concept of Windows Phone, creating different mechanisms and different things to help your application go outside of your application. Um, we are doing a lot of that. That, we think, will influence and will help you portray and market your branding much better with the use of tiles and live tiles that I'm going to show you in just a moment. The splash screen, being able to connect to the music and video hub, and the exposure that you have in the marketplace and windowsphone.com. Also, in terms of the hardware, the hardware is part also of the Metro design language. So leveraging the hardware buttons, the accelerometer and gyroscope, 
the microphone cameras, etc. All those things are part of creating an experience that feels unified with uh, Windows Phone. So let's talk about tiles, because I've been kind of implying I, I was going to get here eventually. Here they are. So in uh, Windows Phone, we still have those kind of little icons that people can tap to open your application. But we also have these tiles. And tiles are of two types. Could just be flat, static tiles, or live tiles. Live tiles are something that we are recommending highly to developers and designers to create for your applications. Live tiles are not static. They will communicate more information to the user. Like that live tile that I was showing you in that motion example that rotated. So you have your logo or, or your branding and it, it, ro it rotates and it provides a little bit of information to the user. It's a way for the user to use your application even before launching your actual application. It gives more value to your application. The, the better that the live tile is and the more uh, relevant the information uh, is, the more that your application will have your users. Those tiles can be pinned or anchored to the start screen. That is a really good way actually for you guys to determine when you have a really good set of loyal uh, fans and users. When someone pins your application to the start screen, that means your app is fundamental literally for their lives. Um, in terms of notifications, and live tiles. You can see the Xbox Live has a notification there, uh, number seven, which in this particular case, case could be new friend invites or new games. It's not very clear. So there are other ways in, even when uh, to do that, like this one's here, right? So in this case, you're getting a notification that there is a happy hour on Tuesdays. Here, they're telling you there is a dr the drink of the day is the grape houdini. <laughs> or here, they're telling you how many points you've collected for going to different perhaps feature bars or restaurants. So notifications are a really good way to convey information. And again, Corina will show us, uh, teach us how you can display some of that information and have these tiles rotate. Now, we care so much about branding uh, that we actually have this thing called alpha, alpha composite in tiles. And basically what this means is that you can use a PNG image in your tile. And so if you go to something like Photoshop, or maybe this was like, a, could be Photoshop Illustrator, you could leave the empty, the, that center area of the, the glass empty, right? You export that to a PNG image, which as we know can store transparency, uh, transparency with alpha channel. And so that helps the accent color of the user be visible throughout your tile. That's a really cool thing because it's still your brand, but you're bringing in, bringing a little bit of that personalized experience for the user. That can be taken even to other levels. And uh, let me see if that's kind of clear. Yeah, it's kind of visible there. So you can see that here in the, in the glass that we were talking about, the word bar, Metro Bar could be the name of that restaurant or bar in particular. And then notice here in Photoshop, if you have a grayscale image, as you know, you can remove all the white or the black proportionally and make that semi-transparent. So that's what the designer did here. And so this martini glass still has those shades, but it's letting the accent color of the user show up. So there are a lot of creative ways in which you can leverage this alpha composite or PNG capability in tiles. So, okay, so this has been uh, Metro, uh, Metro language. Now I wanna give you an idea of how we are encouraging uh, ourselves and of course you guys as well to think of when creating and designing experiences for a phone. And the way that we're envisioning the, the ecosystem is that we are doing a lot of work to, uh, to help your applications become end-to-end -end experiences. So the way we th see applications is actually, we don't see applications anymore as isolated applications or isolated entities of their own. 
We see applications as applications that can connect to other applications and to other information and data and can create end-to-end -end experiences. The ability to hook up to the music and video hub, the ability to hook up to the contacts list, to the map, to maps, to browser, all these things ex start extending your application beyond your application. Things like tiles and notifications. And that's the same kind of philosophy that we're uh, using for the other platforms that we're creating in Microsoft. So instead of thinking of an application for phone, think of the entire experience. So for instance here, instead of thinking of an application for sailing, let's think of the sailing experience for the user. So this app, for example, is a collection, it's a mashup of data that comes from different sources. And this is nothing new, right? We've been doing this on the web for a long time, but on mobile it's the same thing have weather conditions from one service, route, uh, this route section, maps, GPS, destinations, which could be coming from a popular sailing magazine, and alerts, perhaps from the national alert system. All this information basically lives in the cloud, right? It lives everywhere. And it is our job as developers and designers to tailor and shape that information so that it matches the different form factors that we're targeting from phone to tablets to desktops to the TV. It's the same information, but we define the experience as a continuum. Here's another example. Instead of thinking of a running application, or an application for running, let's think of the running experience as a whole. So this is uh, Nike Plus, an app, right? You have the workouts that you're interested in, that you're planning to do. You have routes that you could be taking. You have your bodies, which is basically a context list and challenges. People are challenging, challenging you to, to run uh, X amount of miles or kilometers. Um, now, how can an application, how can the experience of running be understood? Well, it requires of understanding multiple information that comes from multiple applications. So in this case, we have a weather application where we can see that Las Vegas has 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And we have a friend named Anne, and we know we have her as a friend because she's in our contacts list. And so by knowing information of these two different applications, we could have a tile up there that says, well, Anne is currently in a really nice weather, right? Now, here's another example. Anne, separate application, contacts list, is our friend. And then in another application, we know that Anne is planning to run, right? He has been running lately. And so we can do another tile where we can determine whether Anne is running or not, or, she, or she's planning to run today. But what if we take this to the next level, and now we have three applications. So now we know we have a friend named Anne, and we know she lives in Las Vegas, and it's 75 degrees, so perfect weather for running, and we know she's planning to run. So why not challenge Anne for a run? And so the tile up there is able to propose us information and to create or define relevant information or better, with better intelligence by understanding what's happening across multiple applications. And that's again another way that we are encouraging ourselves and encouraging you guys as well to create these type of experiences. And the last uh, example I want to share with you is this one, which it takes us back to the basics, right? What is the phone today? This is a question that Bill Boxton I'm sure many of you have heard of Bill Buxton, uh, senior researcher, design researcher in Microsoft, tons of years of experience. Um, he asked this question a few months ago in a meeting. Ask yourselves, what is the phone, right? So let's think of the phone experience. And the way that he describes the phone today is that you're walking on the street with this thing we tend to call the phone, right? And we're making a phone call. But then we get into our car, we hook up our phone to the car, and the car might have something like uh, Microsoft Sync. And so that action of, hook, of plugging in your phone to the car transforms the phone, it tra makes the phone your car, right? Like your, your car is now the phone. You have the speakers, you have integrated microphones. And so that phone functionality has been transferred to the car. The car is your phone. You park, you step out of the car, you get your phone, and that again transfers the functionality back to this device of what is the phone? Well, the phone is this thing again. We go to our office, we plug our phone to our desktop, and now the functionality of the phone gets transferred to our desktop. What is the phone? So the phone 
instead of thinking it anymore of this is the phone, this particular thing that we now call the, the phone, right? It really is the phone experience depending on the different devices and the different locations that you're in. So this is another way of thinking about this. Now I want to show you uh, a few uh, videos, very short videos, that will give you a very good sense of how by thinking in terms of experiences, you can also react much better to customer expectations because we are all part of the, the tech industry, right? And in the tech industry, everything is fast and furious and expectations keep changing every moment. And that's not only for big companies like Microsoft or Google or Apple, it's also for you guys. You guys create an app or you train yourself in a technology and then the next technology comes in, right? So it's super fast. So by thinking in terms of experiences, you will be thinking uh, in a way that will make everything that you create much more relevant for people. I hope these uh, uh, almost two hours of content now have been uh, valuable to you as an introduction to what Metro is, where it comes from, the things that uh, give us inspiration, the international typographic style, uh, things like Helvetica, all these things, to come up with Metro.